director, uh, Andy Shainis, and then uh, Jean-Gabriel Cuby, the, the future director of CFHT, uh, give us a presentation, uh, basically a report of uh, CFHT. Please Indeed. go ahead. Indeed. Thank you, Nicola. Um, okay. Well, as you all know, I'm the interim director. I've been doing that since uh, last August, and I will be happy to hand the keys over to Jean-Gabriel uh, July 15th. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the status of the observatory right now and some aspects of the future of the observatory. And then Jean-Gabriel will finish with his vision of the future. So um, if we can figure out how to advance. Uh, just hit return or? Okay. So maybe the most important thing that has happened recently is of a political nature. I could give the entire talk about this, but I'm not going to. We, I will just introduce it and allow you to come and talk to any of the, the Hawaii representatives here uh, directly. But suffice it to say that there's a new state bill that has passed the legislature, which essentially uh, creates a new entity to manage Mauna Kea. So University of Hawaii is no longer managing it. It's a new entity. And that entity is the outcome of a year long process, the Mauna Kea uh, Working Group. Uh, which was uh, largely representative of the Native Hawaiian community. And the new authority has some very, very positive aspects to it. Um, it's an 11 member authority that has representation from the Native Hawaiian community in all aspects of the management of the mountain. Uh, it has a five year transition period. Uh, all the leases are currently in place. New leases will be negotiated uh, with this authority. Um, uh, effectively, uh, as soon as the authority uh, is formed, which is effectively 2023, that negotiation will take place for uh, about the following N years, where N is up to five. Um, and then essentially they will be managing uh, all aspects of our interaction and our lease. So I think it's, uh, it's incredibly positive uh, because it contains uh, representatives essentially from all the interests on the mountain. Uh, and it includes enshrines even uh, astronomy as a policy of the state. So it's clear that this, uh, this process is designed uh, to further astronomy, but in a way that uh, allows for representation from the indigenous community. Uh, so uh, the things I'm gonna talk about as far as the observatory is concerned, uh, the uh, status of the telescope and the instruments. The telescope, uh, unfortunately, we've had a uh, earthquake related issue, which I will talk a little bit about. Doesn't affect really the performance of our uh, spectrographs, but it does affect the image quality of Megacam. Uh, and I'll also say a little bit about the Spiru upgrade, which is scheduled for July. Uh, the Spiru team will be here, so. I recommend if you have questions, you can talk to them directly. Um, so the major upgrade is going to happen um, in July, and primarily it's to upgrade the new slicer, add some thermal isolation to the fiber feed through, and install an LED to flash the detector and perform some maintenance. So this is all invasive surgery. It requires us to open up the cryostat, um, which is a fairly lengthy process because you have to close it up and uh, reach vacuum and temperature again. But the outcome should be better, better scrambling uh, if the new slicer is available and demonstrates that it is uh, performing better than the previous one. Lower thermal background, as you know, Spiru doesn't quite uh, meet the specification. In the red end of the K band, it's got a higher thermal background and it's been, we believe, uh, isolated to the fiber th feed through. So this will reduce that background and uh, will lower the RV signature from the persistence for a, due to flashing the, the uh, detector to reduce the persistence on the H4RG. Um, and so we expect that to be happening in the middle of the summer. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the exciting earthquake that we had. So in addition to volcanoes, we have earthquakes in Hawaii. They happen all the time. Usually they don't cause a problem to the observatory. Uh, this one unfortunately did. 
So here you see we actually have one of the best seismographs on the mountain. Um, and this is the acceleration, gravitational acceleration as a function of time. And then we tried to line up the mirror support load with it to show that the loads, this is the pressure on the individual supports, they all changed right after the earthquake. And the guys have isolated this problem to one of the pucks. These are the hydraulic uh, pucks that support the mirror and uh, allow you to maintain the, the perfect mirror figure. This one is leaking, so we essentially shut it off, which means this is a, uh, essentially a, a low spot in the mirror now. Uh, and the end result is not pretty as far as imaging is concerned. As I said, it doesn't really affect spectroscopy that much, maybe very, very slightly the sensitivity. But unfortunately, the impact to imaging is significant. And so here, this is a full width half, half max map of the entire field of view. This is an ellipticity map. Uh, these were uh, <coughs> produced by Emmanuel Breton. Um, and you see the full width half max in the lower left corner is uh, increased significantly, um, which isn't as much of a problem, but the fact that it's asymmetrical, in fact, by kind of a bilobed uh, ugly star image here, this is very problematic and particularly uh, in the U-band for CFIS. So our plan is to fix this as soon as we can. Unfortunately, it requires uh, having parts and components made uh, for this uh, pneumatic system. They are on order. Uh, it will not be repaired before June because we know it's gonna take at least till June to get the components. But uh, essentially what will happen is this repair requires uh, essentially removing the primary mirror from the cell in the same way that when we do our shutdown every three years to recoat the mirror. So we, we, what we plan to do is to recoat the mirror while we've got it out. Um, and so it, it's going to be a week long process. Um, and we'll be doing that a year early. It's kind of unfortunate because uh, the new um, anti-fogging system that we implemented at the last shutdown has proven, I should have uh, shown the, um, um, the zero points curve, but it's proven out that, uh, that essentially the condensation has been a, probably the biggest uh, negative aspect to the, the mirror coating. Uh, the mirror coatings are performing extremely well as a function of time. Essentially what I'm saying is we don't really need to recoat because they haven't been degrading as fast, but thanks to the earthquake, we do. Um, okay, so I'm going to give a very quick couple of comments about MSE. There is an entire MSE talk, um, I think on Wednesday, that our project scientist Jennifer Marshall will be giving, um, but uh, I will introduce it. And there's another talk that Sam Barden is going to give also on Wednesday about the telescope design. So uh, a couple of things are going on. Uh, with MSC uh, in parallel. The first is that we are exploring the possibility of changing the mirror design uh, to a uh, essentially a different kind of a telescope, one that is uh, much more similar to LSST. It has the advantages that it folds the beam to the side, which allows us better access to uh, the instrumentation. Uh, previous telescope had the instruments at prime focus. So since they shadow the beam, they have to be smaller. Uh, this allows for a much larger uh, instrument suite. The upshot is four to time, five times more fibers over the same field of view, uh, opening up a much uh, better cosmology case as well as a galaxy evolution case um, for MSE and for the new telescope. Uh, it also has the distinct advantage that it fits in the same size dome, which has certain political ramifications that, uh, that uh, should be obvious. Um, and so the plan is that, <clears throat> you know, that we did evaluate in the past four different telescope designs, and they were competed against each other and externally vetted. The plan is to bring up uh, this design to the same concept review level and 
uh, recompete it against the existing design to see if it's worth uh, the cost, uh, increased cost. And primarily the increased cost is due to the fact that not only does it have four to five times as many fibers, that includes four to five times as many spectrographs. Um, so uh, it's really a question of this increased cost, uh, is it worth uh, this increased cost in order to introduce you know, the additional cosmology and galaxy evolution science capability? Um, I'll say just a couple of words about the Astro 2020 report. Uh, we got some extremely good news for those of you that haven't. So this is the US National Academy of Sciences report comes out every 10 years to tell the Congress essentially what uh, the collective will of astronomy is in what our priorities are. Um, and it contains wording for a hundred million dollar grant for a spectros dedicated spectroscopic survey facility. It doesn't say MSC. It's up to us to convince them that this is what they were talking about. Um, and it also calls for upgrades to existing facilities in return for community access. So we have a plan to build a Pathfinder instrument for MSE, uh, which addresses um, that third point from uh, the uh, Astro 2020 report. And so the Pathfinder concept, this was introduced to the board in December. They uh, essentially uh, verbally um, supported this uh, concept and uh, verbally supported uh, the uh, uh, return of something up, up to 200 nights uh, to the US community in return for an investment by NSF. And so what we would do is build a visible and near infrared spectrograph that are the first light instruments for MSE exact same design as MSEs, um, but they would be installed early on at CFHT as an additional capability to add wide field spectroscopic survey capability to CFHT now in order to retire some of the technical and scientific risks associated with MSE in order to start developing the software and targeting uh, uh, packages um, and also to bring in the US community as a full partner to MSE uh, through the uh, National Science Foundation investment. It could either go at prime focus or at bent CAS. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages. At bent CAS, it would be designed in such a way that it would work with the vision system, which we'll hear an entire talk about, I think in about 15 minutes. Uh, or 20 minutes. Um, but the upshot is that, um, that this would um, essentially be totally funded from an NSF grant and would allow us to develop both the hardware, software, and engineering design for MSE well in advance of uh, additional investments. Um, so main science art cases, time domain astrophysics, galactic archaeology, and generalized spectroscopy of stars on a large scale. Um, and the things that we're trying to retire, retire the risks, you know, the idea, the targeting and scheduling software, um, you're going to have multiple pointings that have both large programs, PI programs, and targets of opportunity. And you want to develop a, an efficient way to do those observations in a way that you reach completeness for the large programs without shortchanging the PI programs and still being able to uh, take care of the targets of opportunity. Um, sky subtraction, uh, arguably there aren't any uh, fiber fed spectrographs that actually routinely reach the Poisson limit. Um, so the more that, especially in the infrared, the more that we can do to understand this in advance uh, the better off we are. Uh, certainly foremost, we'll be working on this. They have the same type of tilting spine, but they're not working in the infrared. Uh, and lastly, the developing the data management and data analysis tools for this significantly large amount of data coming every day. Um, 
couple of words about funding. I'll say uh, China has uh, re-signed the new associate partner agreement, uh, and I misspelled Asia A. Um, of course, Bill Check fixed it for me. Uh, AJA has agreed to sign the MOU is out for signature. We're in discussion with at least one new potential partner. In this case, it's the US Naval Observatory. And as far as funding is concerned, uh, Pat Hall and others have led uh, a CFI funding proposal in Canada for about $16 million for a spectroscopic survey facility. And the uh, NSF proposals that I'm talking about, so MSIP is the proposal for the Pathfinder, uh, which is somewhere between four and $30 million. That's not that we don't understand how much the Pathfinder costs. These are the limits for the program. Uh, the MSRI program is uh, uh, one way that we will attempt to fund um, the beginning of the preliminary design phase uh, for MSC itself. And then there, you know, there's the possibility of unsolicited proposals, um, which is how most very big projects get funded. Lastly, I throw up our current schedule. Um, so <clears throat> MSIP, if we are successful proposing that uh, this year, with funding would likely come in at the end of 2023. This funds the uh, Pathfinder. It also allows us to start PDP because there's a lot of overlap between the two. Um, <clears throat> Vision, which you'll hear more about, uh, if it's funded and built, would be commissioned in 2024. Tied to that would be decommissioning of one of the existing instruments. Pathfinder would be commissioned in 2026 if it, this is funded in 2023. Tied to that is decommissioning of another instrument. The master lease is in here, but it's decoupled essentially um, from the development of MSE. Um, if the M NSF MSRI2 is funded towards the end of the decade, as uh, mentioned in the Astro 2020 report, that would allow us uh, essentially uh, for first site light science operations uh, by 2035 or possibly earlier. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially decommissioning CFHT starting in 2028 in order to make that uh, 2035 deadline. And I think that is all I'm going to say, and I'm going to hand it over. And I guess we'll save the questions till the end. Sound, sound good? Yeah, there's a, there's a Q&A session at the very end as well. Uh, so if we're running a little late, we might shift them to... Uh, that time. Maybe in the meantime, I see there's already a, a question by Dennis. So the, the, the Dennis's question is, will CADC be archiving the data from the MSC Pathfinder? To be determined. Why, why not? <laughs> All I mean, right, so we I can, I can certainly, I can assure you that we certainly plan to. So this is from Mike Alexanderson. Megacam is not listed for decommissioning on the timeline. Will it stick around CFHT as a whole until, until CFHT as a whole is decommissioned in 2028? That's what the current timeline says. But this is a Wait for the microphone. So that's what the current timeline says, but uh, this timeline is a work in progress. Um, and so, you know, at the moment, um, I would say you, you could dr draw that conclusion, uh, but things may change. Um, does Kevin have anything to say about Megacam's longevity? Stays until Kevin retires. <laughs> <laughs> so Laura Parker from the SAC says, Wednesday's session, we can also discuss instrumentation decommissioning possibilities. So this sounds like a to be continued and to be discussed extensively over this week and the coming years. 